Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, thank you all. Would like to start uh, our session. We're a bit late, but um, we'll keep time. So welcome you all to this wonderful uh, session. Let me start. Uh, this is a world of 50-50 representation, getting girls into STEAM. So let me welcome you uh, to the session. Feel free, we are going to interact. You'll be able to ask questions and all that. And again, let me welcome uh, the speakers today. We have Yasmin. Just say hi. <laughs> we have Kenneth. And we have... Emma. Hello. <laughs> Emma. Okay, so they are going to talk about uh, what they do. So you uh, feel free to ask anything to do with getting girls uh, into STEAM. So first, let me ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, what do they basically do before they give us a presentation? Yasmin, you can start. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Okay, my name is Yasmin. I'm from Malaysia. And... Um, I'm the uh, top 50 uh, Global Teacher Prize finalist for 2015, the first in Southeast Asia and Malaysia for school teachers. And uh, I'm here to talk about um, STEM. But um, uh, bear with me that I actually teach boys for the past 15 years. Okay, to you. Okay, thank you, Yasmin. Kenneth? Uh, my name's Ken Silburn. I'm from Australia. And I was fortunate to be the, the top 10 in, for the Vaki Awards for... Um, 2017. Seems a long time ago. All right, thank you. Hello. Uh, my name's Emma. I live and work in London in the UK, and this is my first time here, so I'm one of the top 50 finalists for this year. And I teach physics, and my passion is getting more girls into physics and engineering, and that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, thank you, Emma. So um, the focus in their presentation is um, why do we have to encourage girls to pursue uh, STEM subjects, and what do they do? Basically, uh, they will tell us what they do uh, to set um, conditions where girls will feel encouraged and they should uh, pursue the uh, STEM sub uh, subjects. This is an interesting area because um, in most part of the world, including my country, by the way, I'm Chifunilo from Malawi, so we have um, we have challenges with the girls pursuing STEM subjects. That's why uh, it's a topic that we really need to discuss and to help one another how they do it so that we can learn. Okay, so um, are you ready, Yasmin? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so she have a presentation uh, on what she does so that we can learn. Okay. Okay. okay um, so like I tell everyone that um, I teach boys, and these are my credentials and awards, and yes, I'm a girl, right? So, <laughs> so with all these um, awards uh, that I've achieved so far, so it goes to show that my country, Malaysia, did not have any restrictions on girls okay, into STEM. And I'm going to show you, okay, these are the statistics from my country um, as of August 2018. And you can see, if you can see, if you can zoom in, Okay, and um, wait, let me show you. Okay, so we have science here, and here is written form four and form five, and you could see that the number of girls, 16,000 students and 15,000 students per year, are taking science stream subjects in my country. So it goes to show that there's no restriction. So we are free to study whatever we want, and um, we are also free to pursue whatever we wanted. Okay, and as I teach boys, I get them into activities like this, like hiking activities, and um, which is uh, why we won the Brian Lara Prize Award in 2017. You could see my Hall of Fame over there, okay? And <clears throat> I teach my boys Master Chef Challenge, okay? So I teach them how to cook, okay, in my science class. And this is a new venture that I did because of the 15 years I have been teaching boys, I, don't, I do not want to leave the school because I felt that I need to empower the boys to empower girls. So what happened last day is that we, go, we went to this girls' school and my boys did this activity, a forensic activity okay, with a group of girls. And then after that, the girls replicate our work in school. 
So it goes to show that it doesn't matter if it's boys or girls, but we need to give them ample opportunity and um, the same uh, chances okay, to pursue STEM. And the girls did a good job. So look at how enthusiastic they are, actually. But sad to say that although the number of students in Malaysia, we have the number of students, a very high number of students, girls especially, who's doing science subject, but after the tertiary education, I guess it goes with the culture, okay? When you are a woman, so you are gonna pursue your family, so you take a step back. But I do not have the statistic to, pers uh, to publish here. But that's what happened, because I was a former engineer as well. I was an analytical engineer, and after about uh, two years, and my father said that I talk a lot, so you should be a teacher. Well, at that time, I pursued what my father wanted, but at the same time, it goes into my head that I cannot just be a teacher. So I have to be an extraordinary teacher, so I, instead of... Um, for foregoing my goals in uh, being an engineer, I'm still engineering minds. So I engineer the minds of my boys to empower girls. Okay, and this is an activity we did last year with Asian, uh, with ASEAN teachers. So we had these girls with us. And these are a picture of my boys uh, with the girls. We're doing forensic activity. Yeah, so it goes to show that in my country, there's no restriction and um, we can do, yeah? We can pursue whatever we wanted. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we give her a hand? Okay. Um, before, uh, before Emma, I don't know if you have any questions, but there's something interesting that Yasmin said um, that she focuses on empowering the boys so that they can empower the girls. Um, I'm just interested. How effective, um, how effective is that where you trust the boys that they can also empower the girls? How is the relationship uh, between them and how responsible are the boys in empowering the girls? Okay. Yeah. When I took my boys to the girls' school, they are actually quite shy. In a, girl, in a school where there's 100, uh, sorry, 800 girls and three boys, they're very shy. But I told them, I said that, look, you have this amount of knowledge that I've empowered you. Why did you try to empower the girls? And they asked me, why do you want to do that? I said, if you cannot empower the girls, then how can I empower you as people, as, as my students? And I said that you are going, my, or you are going to be my change. You know, my, my uh, what do you call it? <clears throat> my power of change for the students. And then they started the activity with the girls, which is quite interesting to see. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, is anyone else with a question? Please let's uh, interact because they're here. We want you to ask them questions, let them clarify, we want to learn. And even our, the other speakers, you're free to ask. Yeah. I'll be asking Yasmin. Yasmin, yeah. what were the challenges that you uh, had in order to have such thing successful? Mm, my challenges in school was like, because I'm a female teacher teaching chemistry, and uh, initially when my students come in and they were like, oh, you're a women teacher, right? So um, do you actually hold the Bunsen burner and light it up yourself? I say, I do more, okay? And um, during the first class, I justify the fact that I can do so much, actually. So, so the teacher has to go a little bit of extra mile to prove you know, yourself to a bunch of boys um, that you are actually capable of teaching them. Yeah? But um, because of the status that I uh, already obtained yeah, from Varki Foundation, so because of the achievement that I've uh, published uh, in media in, in Malaysia, I'm a rock star in Malaysia, so, so basically the boys knew that there's a certain uh, criteria that this teacher has. But what about the other female teachers? Yeah, they have to prove themselves actually to the boys. And it's not easy. Yeah. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, anyone else? Emma? Okay. 
So my context is slightly different. I have taught in co-educational schools, so with boys and girls. I've recently moved to an all-girls environment. Uh, my passion project has been something that I called Girls in Physics, and it came out of the frustration I think a lot of people feel in the UK um, and across Europe, actually, because the statistics are fairly similar. But girls attain highly. They enjoy the subject. They're enthusiastic. They're engaged but they don't pursue it after um, they've finished their compulsory study of science up to age 16. So they don't continue with it for A-level uh, or onto university in numbers that have really changed in the last 30 years. So for about 30 years in the UK, the percentage of female participants studying physics at university has kind of flatlined at about 22%. And it's so frustrating to me as a physicist, as a physics teacher, that there are lots of girls who are clearly interested, but there's something kind of standing in the way. So um, I spent time looking at all the education research. Uh, there's a huge amount of research that says that mothers are the biggest influencer on a girl's, um, actually girls and boys, but their subject choices for the future. And I kind of was looking at universities and workplaces where women have networks to support them. Um, so created these events called Girls in Physics, which uh, invited girls and their mothers from across London, from a range of schools, to come and hear from speakers who are professionals in physics uh, and engineering research, or they've chosen that as their profession. And it has been amazing to see uh, girls engage with those speakers, to see the range of jobs and careers that are out there, and for parents, for their mothers to see that too, to see, um, and I mean, I know that any of you who do science might come up against this stereotype a lot, but to say, oh, look how normal, they're really normal, and oh wow, I didn't know that you could do that um, with, with physics and engineering, and to, to make those connections between the girls. Lots of the girls are the only students in their class, age 17 or 18, um, they're only female student in a, in a group of boys, and to kind of be supported by each other, and to see what yeah, opportunities are available to them later in life, uh, is absolutely amazing. And, um, so I have moved on from that school, but it's running as a legacy project, which is amazing. And I'm now working on looking at, in an all-girls environment, what's working so well that means that the educational outcomes when you're in a single-sex environment are so different, because that is the, that's the environment where most you get the highest percentage of girls choosing to study physics and engineering. OK, thank you, Emma. Uh, let's, give, let's give Emma a hand okay, before we ask. We have a hand. Hi, Emma. Yeah, I was wondering why is that that the girls are not, I mean, they drop out of physics or something, because my daughter, she's in college and she, she's doing technology engineering. She's the only girl among the 10, uh, actually 11 in her class. And that it didn't intimidate her because the, the personality that she is, you know, she has. However, others are not. I'm, I'm wondering why is that? So every piece of research says that girls who um, persist in a field where they are in their minority perform to exceptional standards. So they're the people who get the highest grades, they um, are doing the best, and they kind of have been equipped in some way, whether it's through teaching or with their families, to reach that standard, and then they're coming top of their class. But there's this whole section, this whole swathe of people who would absolutely be capable of doing it, but they're not they're not taking up, and I think it is, and I say society, but this, I'm talking about my own context, obviously this, if you're talking about technology in yours, that will apply in yours too, but people are telling them all the time, or just inferring that it's not for them, and there's this perception of it not being for me, and I don't identify with what, what those, those jobs are. Um, all the research as well shows that girls are thinking about careers and jobs and where things can take them a lot earlier than boys are, so, I think a lot of boys keep studying physics uh, and maths as well, and then they get to the point where they um, they then go, oh, I could I could try this, um, and it's really interesting because you know I said that in the UK the percentage of female physicists at a university has kind of flatlined for 30 years. Well, in maths it's gone from about the same, at kind of 22% 30 years ago, and it's about 45% now, um, and part of that has I think has been the introduction that you have to study maths to. Uh, take medicine at university so a lot of girls continue to study it so they still have it in their arsenal they still enjoy it and they are equipped 
and then they start to see, oh, actually, this could take me down a different path, and they choose it. So I think we need to keep options available to them. I think we need to make careers and jobs information accessible to students and their parents so they understand earlier, you know, from primary school, actually, um, when they're make and they're starting to make these decisions and starting to form these stereotypes and keep pushing back against what a lot of society is saying is normal or is for them. Okay, thank you, Emma. Um, okay. Hello. So everybody speaks about steam. Now is talking about STEAM and put in more arts so that you have more number of students into your STEM program. What are your views on that? Um, one of the things, I mean, STEM is, is just the, the abbreviation for science, technology, engineering and maths. And, and every time when you do it, there's no way you can do it without having art. There's no way you can have you can do it without having creativity, so um, you know it's just it's, it's it's what we expect, but um, but we're we're stuck with with STEM as the acronym. I, I I do think so. Having visited some different countries, some countries are now having STEM lessons, whereas uh, we very much have biology, chemistry, physics, art, and so, so you can bring all those different disciplines into your lessons, but. I, I don't have a curriculum where we have a separate STEM or STEAM kind of period on the timetable, whereas I know some people do and they can kind of bring those things together. But I absolutely agree. I think creativity is essential to science, so they just match up and hopefully teachers are bringing those things together in their lessons. Hi, um, I'm Violet Lo from China, Hong Kong. Um, we, we have, okay, I'm, I'm very excited to tell you that, in fact, I absolutely agree that it's not just STEM with us, STEM plus everything. So we have this STEM plus leadership, actually for the past few years, a thousand, a thousand of people, but it's not just plus art and culture, health and environment, business entrepreneurship, and anything you can think of, sport, last year we did the quantum music, music become quantum physics. So what we find that not only that actually sometime we talk about girls. Um, I start as an artist, I become mathematician. I got my PhD in mathematics. No one believe it possible. But because, because I study art, I saw pattern in mathematics. That's changed my life. And give you today, um, I can speak to you about what we see in China. You still have a lot of girls raise their hand. Why there's so much, so many women, um, like at the end, end of the day, like uh, less women in the science industry. You talk about the opportunity, but what we see in the education all the way, 50 50 percent. But then why in the industry job below <laughs> maybe 20 percent even? What happened? If you ask the girl what is the answer, they raise their hand, but the answer was surprising. Because woman has no IQ. Now that's crazy. So we need to change the mindset. And we have done it because when they realize that real music, you can be quantum music. Actually, we just launched the album. And all of a sudden, actually, they realize that to be good at science is not just, it's like what you, look, you need to look like Einstein or someone like that. But it's like you can creative, um, creative curios cur curiosity is so important. And when actually the, the, what drives the young people, what they can use them to change the world as be part of the life, that's changed the whole thing. And I actually would love to share with any of you who want to find out, and it has been working really, really well. Bring the science, bring the arts in. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, okay. okay, wait, after her. Okay, what I've liked about uh, that is really someone can think that girls do not have an IQ. That we have a lot to do. This goes to educators, our parents, to change the attitude, you know. Thank you very much. Okay, can I take a last question and then we hear a presentation from Kenneth. Thank you. Um, good morning, thank you. Uh, my name is Farshida Zafar. I'm from the Erasmus University in the Netherlands. 
Um, I'm asking you a question not on behalf of myself, but on behalf of my two daughters who are both coders and crazy about math and science. And Amazing. Um, so we Googled all of you and we read some things about you. Oh, that is very scary. Very. <laughs> it wasn't my idea, trust me. Okay. I'm a, a lawyer with a tech technology degree as well. So I told them there are some privacy implications and they said, well, we use technology, so we can use a VPN and we'll be safe. Um, so my daughters, um, they both have a vision where they want to be in 10 years. Trust me, I have nothing to do with this. Um, and they told me, how is it that in every discussion when we talk about science or art or mathematics or whatever that is not social sciences, we always expect girls to change? We always expect girls to act differently, to adapt their behavior, adapt their curiosity or interest. Why is that? I mean, as long as all these girls are going to end up on a workforce with guys, it shouldn't be the question, how do we help guys socialize with girls? So not my question again. These are my daughter's questions. So. I think I'll take that. Yes, okay, yes, um, when you say that um, we should actually empower boys to help them socialize with girls, right? Which is what your daughters are looking to, which is actually um, what I've been doing in school. Although I'm teaching them chemistry, but we're not really doing technology and engineering. But at the same time, I'm taking them to mountains to hike, and there's only like me and another teacher, and both of us are female teachers. So we don't bring the male teachers in. We let our boys take care of us like princesses. In fact, my students were like, you know, holding my hand and they were like, teacher, you're like a princess. And I said, yes, because one day you will have, you know, to act like this with your uh, girlfriend and also wife. And they were like, so are you teaching us how to be, you know, better uh, husband? I said, why not? Okay, so in order, um, I mean, even in classes also, although we are doing chemistry experiments, but the way that the boys are acting to me, it's as if like, you know, I'm the queen in their class. And that's what it should be. Okay, that's, what, that's how we teach our boys to be uh, more acceptable to the girls. Because there's, there's, um, there's a stigma, you know, because um, this may be a bit um, harsh, but when they're talking to themselves, okay, they were like, oh, that person, you know, they use, they didn't use their name when they talk about girls. They use a, a colloquial name, which I do not want to mention here. But then I corrected them back. I said that, okay, you shouldn't do this. Yeah? It, the, the respect has to be there when you talk about uh, girls. So that's what it is. Can I just pick up one of the... Um, if you look at any research journals on girls' education, it always tells you that girls perform better if they're in a single-sex class. And that's because... If it's science, the boys tend to take over. Now, unfortunately, there's so many schools that will, will trial having a single sex class for girls, but they end up migrating back into having the co-ed class because nobody wants to teach the boys class because the boys class will be rowdy and the, um, the principal will say, well, if we put the girls back, it will settle the boys. And um, when, we, when we talk about 50-50, you know, that's totally against what we're talking about, but that's the practice. Yeah. And just in, re in response to the, your daughter's questions about why are we asking the girls, girls to change, that was what they were saying, right? Um, I, d I, don't think any, I don't think any of us in the classroom are, are doing that. I think we are trying to, to say, actually, we, do, we need to make the path clearer and move more of the restrictions and open up more of the opportunities but I totally agree with your daughters that there's there shouldn't be any way that the girls have to adapt or change themselves in order to pursue what they're interested in and what they're passionate about. Okay thank you. Um, what Emma said of there's something that she said about role models. Um, yesterday there was a presentation on a research that was done uh, to find out how uh, bringing, uh, bringing professionals into the classroom to actually bring their real concept helps in performance of students rather than just talking about it. So I've seen really how role modeling can uh, works 
um, when you're dealing with uh, uh, STEM issues because the girls, they need to know and see actually that this really happens. It's possible, they can do it. That also helps to change their attitude because sometimes when educators just talk about it, it looks, well, not real. They can say, well, yeah, it happens to them. I, uh, well, but role, uh, role models are important. Yes, I, I, do, I do think it's, it's important, it's an important part uh, I worry sometimes that it gets uh, dropped in as the kind of magic solution. Um, I think it's a component, uh, but I think it's not just about uh, hearing from those role models. I think that you have to really get girls to engage with them and see the connections and see themselves and their own experience in that. And I think part of it is them sharing the reality that we are in now of if you're going to go into, the, into certain fields, you will be in the minority and they can share those experiences. And again, the, the research shows that actually telling girls that, we don't have to shy away from it, telling them that actually empowers them and they're more likely to pursue it. So I think it's absolutely, yeah, totally important to get role models in, but also to be truthful and honest about their experiences and then they can know how to navigate those fields and spaces successfully. Okay. All right, thank you, Emma. Um, uh, let's hear uh, from Kenneth. What do you do? Um, Good. We might see if we can get the PowerPoint to start up. Okay. Do, 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 be, do. Cool. Okay. Um, I've been a, a head teacher um, for 18 years, and but what I'm also going to talk about is a program which we call iSTEM. So STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Maths. And the I is because it was for students, and we thought anything that's interesting for students has to have an I in front of it. And um, but we started the, the program nine years ago um, as an extension for students that were interested in science. So, um, we, I mean, you, we actually found that we were getting students, um, mainly girls that were being involved from lots of different schools. And we found that if we took photos of, of girls doing things and getting that out in the press, then it actually promoted the fact that girls would realise they can do science because the people, I mean, there's so many people that will say, no, girls are not good at science. But we just decided to inundate photos of students, oh, it's just gone flipping through, of girls enjoying science. Now, um, one of the, the reasons why I think that we should be going towards making sure that girls pick up science. Um, it's, it's nice to say that we should do it for girls, just for their sake. But when you think about the problems that our world is going to be, well, our world is having now, we've got droughts, we've got, um, this is over in India with floods, um, all the problems that we've, we have to combat against climate change, well, it won't be us. We're not, we, we won't be the ones that will be solving it, it will be our students. Now. There's certain leaders in the world that have came out, and um, I was happy to, because you can recognise someone from you, that have publicly came out and say, to say that we should promote girls to do STEM. Now, their reason isn't because of being nice for girls, it's because they look at photos like this. Now, there's, oh, what, 22, 24 people in the photo, can you recognise how many females? Just one, okay? Right, Mary Curie. Now, this was, I think about 17 of these people went on to get the Nobel Prize. Only one female. So think about that. In the time when this was taken, we would have had the exact same amount of intelligence as females and creativity that we lost that we never actually used. What we are, are seeing now, if we educate girls, then we have to realise that they're just as intelligent and probably even more creative than boys. But if we don't get them to go into STEM, then who is going to solve the problems of the world? You know, we're, we're losing our, our brains. Um, on the money side, Australia, in five years' time, will be around 30 million as far as the population. Um, the jobs are changing, and that's the same all around the world. And if you want to have a country that's going to be 
um, able to have an income because you're going to be you know, wanting to buy food, you need to have a very strong technology base. And if we talk about the money side of it, because people like the, the money, um, then the amount of money that countries develop because of STEM is incredible. And um, the Emirates, um, they're, they're looking at 2050 as being the, the leaders in technology. So they're investing a lot of money. Okay, um, my goal used to be the idea that you know, we should just um, edu or engage students and I think we've got to go past that with girls. We've got to make sure that they can see there's opportunities past, past school that they can actually go into a career. Um, obviously, we've got to make sure that every child's educated and it doesn't matter whether it's boy or girl. Um, and hopefully that we will inspire some of those students to actually pick up science. Um, you can, right, I'm just going to go back. You have to go, ah, oh, when you see this next one. Ah, oh. um, this is um, one of my grandsons, and, and, I, and I know he's not a girl because I haven't got any granddaughters, but I really wonder what the world will be like as, it, as far as education and the workforce when he turns 16 or when he gets into the workforce, you know, 18 plus. Um, I am hoping it's going to be changed so that things are 50-50, that we do actually have... Um, a sharing of, of knowledge in STEM and also in, in creativity. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, let's give him a hand. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Yes, Emma. I just wanted to pick up on something you said about um, the jobs and the future because I totally agree and I think that we are firstly doing girls a massive disservice if we are not allowing them access to this industry. Yep, this, look, most definitely. Yeah. Um, but we're also doing the world a disservice because if you don't have a diverse range of thoughts and a diverse range of voices when products and systems are created, we're not going to be able to function successfully in the world. You know, the incredibly famous example of the uh, Apple phone, one of the biggest manufacturers in the world, omitting the period from a um, health app, whereas every woman will know it's an essential, essential uh, you know, a massive part of their life. Or... We're getting, um, you know, Google Voice and Google Home and Alexa sound systems in people's homes and that artificial intelligence. You know, people are saying, well, why are there no women on those design teams? Um, people perpetuating domestic violence, so using them against women um, to kind of turn up the volume and to limit their lives and do awful things. If there are women on those teams who might have experience of these things, then they can put solutions into the code. We have that capability, but if their voices are not part of that team, then our systems are not going to reflect the reality for everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, I think a, a quick question to all of you. Um, I just want to find out why should we care about gender imbalance in education, in our schools? Why, why should we care at all? Well, all I of mean, you? that's that what, what I just said about being part of, yeah. part of the systems that we are creating, um, making sure that women are paid fairly, that they are, have access to the industries that are paying them the right amounts. Um, yeah. Look, I, I just think because it's fair, because that's the way it should be. That's... And, and okay. going, going back to your economic point earlier, I mean, even if... Even if I mean, all of you care because you're here, but if, even if you don't care and right, you're at the top level, you, you do care about your economy's um, industry. And thinking about the UK, there are not, there are not enough people with the skill sets required for um, the STEM industries. So tap into the massive untapped resource of young women. Okay, yes, ma'am? We are all human, right? So um, put the gender aside, everyone needs food. Yeah, so as to everyone needs them. The knowledge has to be there because in cooking or whatever. So um, it's not that I do not care about gender imbalance, but I felt that it's actually a human need to be empowered in education, to be empowered in STEM subjects especially. So it's not a matter of like, okay, which gender should be more superior to the other. So it's like, it's like a need to themselves. Okay, uh, before I take questions, um, if, 
if we are talking about 50-50 representation, it means we are not leaving out the boys, right? Yeah. So, what do you do in your schools uh, to make sure boys also participate in female-dominated areas? Because we have other areas which we you know, feel they are more dominated by females, yeah. and we shouldn't leave out the boys. Okay, yes. I'm going to take this because I feel very strongly about this. Every discussion that you have about girls in STEM at some point comes around to, but what about the boys? And I think that to get any sort of equality and promote women in STEM, you need national and international equality. You absolutely have to have um, support initiatives on a wider scale to promote gender equality. I want more uh, you know, men in the UK to have access to parental leave. I want uh, to address the mental health crisis in young men. But that's not the thing affecting or limiting women in STEM. And I believe in gender equality, and I, but I think there's a different space for um, what, what are the issues with gender equality and representation. Uh, and I don't see in STEM there being the, the struggle. And, and I support those discussions about young boys in the arts, but I don't think that is the focus of, or even a kind of a, a really big part of this discussion about women in STEM, but I do understand. Okay, thank you, Emma. Um, look, I was, I was just going to touch on last week um, that the Prime Minister of Australia came out with a comment because of, um, of talking about females in leadership and his comment was to say that it would, it's terrific to have females at a high level and we should have more females. Um, however, we should make sure that it's not at the expense of men. And, and I thought that was from the Prime Minister and I thought, well, that's wrong, because we should have you know, the best leaders, regardless of whether they're male or female. And we should have you know, our students. You know, we should have our, you know, if we want to promote female education, what we do is we promote, fe we promote education for boys and girls. So we don't leave anybody out, we promote everybody, we do our best, and that just raises the bar. Hi, uh, I'm Homa, I'm from Pakistan. I come from an organization who's fundamentally supporting women in STEM at all fields and all levels, starting from school to higher education to the industry. So my question would be towards you, doctor, uh, is that like uh, Emma pointed out that right now we see that women in STEM, in computing are somewhat in minority and we have to somehow inculcate that in their learning that these are the challenges that they're going to face. You showed the picture of your grandson. Uh, what I'd ask you is that what you do differently with your grandson to be able to make him a person who supports women in STEM in the next 20 years. What, what and how can we engage men at this point in time to make sure that we have an inclusive society? Well, look, the, the first thing about my grandson, I suppose, what we do is we, we actually sit down, we read books. So um, we, we want him to be well educated so he can actually be a voice and, and then hopefully he'll know what to do. The, um, the other thing I, we've got to really try and push is the opportunities for, for females when they do go into science. So um, you know, if, if a female goes in and it's still that, you know, the, the, it's expected that the female will, you know, when, when you've got kids, will be the person who looks after the kids. Well, we've got to make sure that there's avenues in there so that they're not left behind. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Sort of. You might like. To, I might get you to ask us that again because I don't want to leave a question unanswered. STEM careers, and there are ten other boys in the class. So, what is it that we need to do today? to make sure that those 10 boys are supporting that one girl and rather not making her feel like a minority and that she shouldn't be there or that she doesn't belong there. So what is it that we can do differently in terms of educating boys about the importance of STEM for girls? Okay, what we need to do is make sure that we raise that, that bar, that level for all the students. And, and the one thing I really do hate, and I've, I've seen it in schools where they'll have a day, a university day, which will be just for girls. And so they'll take out 
all of the girls from a year group, put them on a bus, go to the university. And what happens is the boys will still go to school. That there, there won't be any, any you know, good classes. But the boys will, will be convinced that the girls are there because they need the extra help. And the, the girls are separated because they think, uh, we're girls, we need extra help. I think what we need to do is, is make sure we don't, we don't try to promote girls' education by making it look that girls are, are not as good at science. I, I also think in terms of what we can do is we have to support wider gender equality initiatives because um, having visited schools in Sweden, uh, where so I went there because they have three times the percentage of female engineers than in the UK, and you know it's not it's not a perfect utopia or anything. But I went thinking in the classroom they're going to be doing X Y Z, and I can pick up these kind of hot tips to take back, and it's going to be great. I didn't. I just met and interacted with students and teachers who had a better understanding of gender equality and were further ahead in their gender equality. And sometimes that might not be very comfortable to hear, but I think by having policies nationally, like access to parental leave or uh, laws about equal pay, it filters into discussions around the dinner table with families and it empowers people to act differently, both boys and girls, in the way that they treat each other and seeing people, uh, them as people and not genders. So I think anything that teachers can do, I think anything that anyone can do on it to promote and push at a national and international level for that gender equality filters in to make a difference. And um, I, I take up one point that was made about the fact that when it comes to programming, we do have more boys that go into programming and coding, but that's actually started to have the, um, the girls are starting to take over, which is good. But when we look at the top leadership, um, and I hope I've, it's still the same, but in Australia, the head of Microsoft, the head of Google, and... Um, Oh, there was one other technology, um, Ed Rollo, um, the head of those companies, they're, they're female. So um, um, even though they're not doing the coding, their creativity, their management, that's, that's being promoted. And, and that is great, but I think we, want to get, we do want to get to a place where it's not the exceptional and we can name we can name those individuals, it just becomes the normality. And a lot of the time you have someone at the head, you know, they're the first woman or the first person of colour to do X, Y, Z. Don't want that to be part of the narrative anymore. And yes, agree, that yeah. it just, it filters through all the systems, not we've got a few exceptional women, you know, at the top. Hello, um, I'm Maryam from Pakistan. Um, I work with an organization which truly believes in gender equality. Uh, my question would be from Ms. Amma. To just to share, because you know, in Pakistan, it's a very new concept of STEM, um, which is not very much being renowned everywhere across the board. But you know, I really want to ask that how important it is to engage or to work with the school counselors to motivate those young people, including girls and boys, to persuade towards STEM. Because what happens in Pakistan, because you know, um, we always feel that education is not of that quality that gives them power to take decision from where they feel their interest is and from where they feel they want to move forward in their lives. So how do you feel it is important, how much it is important? And second question is that what sort of models you have right now that you have made in your community to engage more girls in this field, how did you persuade? Uh, by school counselor, are you meaning someone who gives guidance about careers and the path that you follow? Okay. Uh, so I think whoever has that role, whatever their title is, I think they're absolutely essential. Uh, I think that te I think that also teachers need professional development to make sure that they are up to date with uh, who you know scientists and who is working in uh, in this field that they can bring into their lessons to be able to promote careers. Um, my own, my own kind of most successful models have been getting people in. So whether that's after school or in the day, um, and really good people are, if there are any universities that are anywhere near, um, PhD students love coming and giving talks because they want to practice their speaking skills. Um, also undergraduates who are in the field that might be relevant to the topic that's being taught in schools or that might be relevant to a career uh, are fantastic people to get in, also because they're free, because um, they, they want to come and uh, promote themselves. Also, anyone who works in science, and you know this, but 
doesn't just fit in a neat box of uh, a school subject. And uh, I've really found the most successful sort of connections that students have made to speakers is those who cross multiple disciplines. So recently had someone in who had been doing their PhD on glaciers on Mars. So they really were talking about um, technology because they were using images from satellites, they were talking about physics, but they were also talking about geography um, and historical excavation, excavation on Earth. And, and all those things being brought together makes students see that there's this wealth of opportunities. So I think trying to make connections with industry or research where possible. Um, and I have to say, especially with getting girls into STEM, women love coming in and trying to support girls getting into STEM. They will give up their time and they will come and help. You know, people want to bring up the next generation. So that's why I found successful. Hello, uh, I'm Bina from uh, India and I head a women's NGO which supports uh, higher education of girls. In a study center for children who come from the uh, marginalized communities to help them with their homework, etc. Um, I uh, would like to say that I feel that now with the uh, thinking that, you know, children should be taught through experience from a preschool age, uh, that's the time when boys and girls would equally learn about mathematics, science, etc. through their experience. And that's, what sh that's the time when ch teachers should actually make it a point to uh, see that support the girls to pick up uh, learning about science so that it becomes something organic for them to go into those kind of st uh, streams of education. And secondly, in uh, the largely developing world, uh, don't you think there should be a campaign in languages uh, appealing to parents that if you want your uh, daughter to actually uh, earn and get a good job, then um, encourage her to take science. I think, you know, we need some sort of a worldwide campaign to push this kind of thought to parents so that they see that there's a great opportunity for their daughters to actually get good jobs if they study science, so they should support them. Yes, I think invi inviting, par well, on a school level, inviting parents to be in and hearing from the same people that the girls are hearing from is essential. Yeah. Because, I mean, we, we've talked about it, but a lot of the time when you have parents come in, they say, oh, I don't know where she gets it from because I hated physics or I'm terrible at maths. Like, it's this genetic component and it's rubbish. Yeah. And then, you know, they engage with it and then they see they come out of things saying, oh, actually, I wish I'd pursued it. I wish I knew more about it. So I absolutely agree with you. I think parents, getting parents on side is essential. Um, Yasmin, what were you going to say? Yeah, um, because I was a former engineer and um, what my parents knew back then was if you're not to be a doctor, then be a teacher. Mm. So, you know, the stigma that they don't, they don't really know about science, let alone STEM. So when when they decided, okay, you should be a teacher, so they do not know that being an engineer is actually my passion. Yeah. So I guess it, yeah, there should be a worldwide, um, what do you call it, campaign yeah, for parents to actually know about what is STEM, what is science, what, what's yeah. the difference between science and math? Because what we're teaching in school nowadays is not just STEM. We're yeah. teaching S and M actually. The T and E is actually quite lost. Yeah. And I know what Kavita is uh, doing. She's doing more on technology. So uh, she's empowering the S and M and to nurture the T and E actually in her school. But um, where parents are concerned actually, even for boys nowadays, like in my, like in my country now, there's only about 20% of students who are taking science, uh, the science stream compared to the art stream. The science is lost because most of the students nowadays, they want to be YouTubers, they want to be Instagrammers and they felt that you know, science is very hard. It deprived them of their social media time. So, and we need to empower parents because parents are also saying that if you study too much, and then you get like, you know, mediocre pay. So it's not going to improve your lifestyle. So what's, uh, what's more, you know, what's more when we talk about gender inequality? So, yeah, I guess yeah, it, we I should think empower it, parents. Yeah, parents should understand that the opposite is true. That yeah. if you study science, you'll actually earn more. Yeah. And that's what parents, uh, that's what matters to parents, I think, eventually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That is good. Um, I've actually got a, a pile of business cards. If, if we could talk later, yeah. that would be really good. And um, one of the things we should also do is, I mean, it's awful when you've got a, a male that's talking about you know, female equality. Um, um, next week, I'm actually off to Uganda and then the following week to Nairobi um, to do some work in schools. And it's always good to make sure that you've, you've got female teachers that are there because you don't want to have men talking about equality. You want to have um, men and females talking about equality. So um, I'm going to point out to Hayley, um, a science teacher from Australia that will be with me for next week as well. So. Hi. Hi, sorry, this is more just a comment and I think we, I totally resonate with the ice stem. Um, we do a program for robotics in an underprivileged orphanage in India. It's an all-girls orphanage. And coming out of STEM, they've just taken on iRobotics now. And they say, well, we're the leaders now for the future. And they like STEM, but they're enjoying iRobotics more. So it's just a comment that the technology they're absorbing and, and taking it to the next level. So just FYI. Can, can I just, because I think the, it's interesting because lots of different countries use STEM different, differently. So the way I would think of STEM is if I'm teaching a physics lesson, I might bring in technology or I might bring in chemistry, but I know that, so I, I would link into robotics. But I, so I, I don't see them as distinct, but I know that some places are very keen on the STEM really coming all four together in a single hour or something like that. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Catherine, I'm from Uganda. And thank you so much for you, the revelations uh, this morning. But now for me, my question is, uh, I teach maths, and uh, that's part of STEM, uh, but I come from a country whereby you find that we, you, some of us who are advocating for STEM, it's very difficult and it makes it very hard to go and talk about something when you know it's not there. For example, for we want these kids to go for STEM careers, to be engineers, to be doctors, to be whatever STEM career you think about what we are talking about here. But now you find that schools, they don't have laboratories. They have no labs. And uh, recently I've been doing a, a report about one of the village where I'm going to establish my project. I found out like 20 schools, they don't have laboratories. And these are girls, all these are children, having a dream of I want to be a doctor. So you, what, what can I, why we as teachers who are advocating for STEM, who are who inspiring these girls to be in STEM, what can I do? Because now that's the situation, it's like telling someone food will come when you know in the kitchen there is no food. So what can we do? Like maybe all of us or what advice? Or you, maybe you have worked in such conditions, maybe which I can take up and maybe inspire the girls, though there is no laboratory in the school, but to keep hope alive. Thank you. But um, even if there's no lab, right, does it mean that we can't do STEM activities? So um, back in Malaysia, we do carnival, STEM carnivals. And when we teach us, because I'm a STEM icon teacher in my country, so they ask us to conduct carnivals in the, uh, not in schools, but in like um, hall. And I was like, how do I do my forensic activity in a hall? But we improvise. We bring our basin, we bring all the stuff, and we make sure that the, the children who come to the carnival are not deprived just because there's no lab. So we make our own kit, you know, it's like a travel kit that I bring around for my forensic. I have a forensic bag that I take everywhere. So everything inside is inside there. I just need like, you know, water, water supply probably in a pail. And that's enough, actually. So we don't have a lab wherever we go. And recently we have a STEM initiative in our country where it's called STEM at Island. Because we have remote islands uh, in the country where they have uh, limited resources. So does that mean that the children doesn't get the access to the carnivals? No, we bring it to them. So we bring the STEM kits, very easy STEM kits that we can take around. And I think Ken can elaborate on that because he has done wonders uh, 
on his stem kits as well. Yeah. The, um, the one thing I suppose is we've just got to make the best of what your condition is. Um, last year I was in a refugee camp and um, when you're teaching 200 students and you're actually sitting underneath a tree, well that's that's totally different from being able to walk into a science lab where you've got Bunsen burners. But, um, but you know, as I said, um, our role as, as educators is to engage students and educate them and hopefully inspire some of them to, to do what, you know, what we need them to do when they leave school. Hi, um, I worked in a school called the African Science Academy last year that's in Ghana and it's quite an interesting model in that it um, takes girls after senior high school and um, it gives them one year of education where they study maths, further maths and physics A level in one year, which is quite a challenge and I've seen those girls when they go to university that they are really respected by their peers as being extremely gifted scientists that's had quite a big impact upon other others in their peer group, especially the boys. Um, but one thing I can see that's really benefited them is an extremely strong support network. Um, so they have access to mentors um, from quite a wide range of countries and from across their country and across Africa. Um, I'm just wondering what, um, what networks exist in STEM for girls um, who perhaps don't have such a great opportunity as to go to a school like that. Like, do you know of any girls in STEM networks and what do you believe the kind of power of a network to be for girls in STEM? I think one of the challenges is that there are a lot of well-intentioned initiatives, but a lot of them cover a small range. So I don't, I don't know of whole, I don't know, national or international networks. You know, that's what I was trying to do in London as an area, um, and that that is a girls in physics network that exists. Um, and there was Capital Physics that ran for a while there, but like everything, funding runs out at some point and it ends up for a short term. Um, you know, when you get to university level, there are excellent networks a lot of the time, but obviously, like, there's that kind of gap um, for girls. Uh, so I know, sorry, I know that's not very, a very hopeful answer, but I don't personally know of large networks that exist because of that yeah, small scale. Yep. The, um, the iSTEM program, we actually created for um, lots of schools as an enrichment program. So it was after school, weekends, and, and night times. And one of the things which I've, I've, it just fell into place was a lot of girls would go to the activities and they would meet up with girls from other schools. And because of that, they actually started up their own networks through Facebook. And it was nice because you know, if you're very keen on science, then you go to school on a Monday and the other kids will talk about football or parties. Well, there's, there's not many people you can talk about with science. But the conversation that these kids have, um, their science is way up there. It's, it's past me. But um, yeah, they, they create their own networks. That, that has been my experience with the network in London is that they then go off and do it themselves. But uh, I think you have to be involved in some sort of program where you can then meet other people like that. Um, you know, there's Girls Who Code. That's a massive, massive program. And, uh, and then again, you meet people like you and you start to create those connections. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sorry um, our time is over, but I know you had questions, you can meet them. These are our uh, Global Teacher Prize finalists, uh, Yasmin was 2015, Kenneth 2017, and Emma 2019. So if you have anything, please feel free uh, to meet them. Otherwise, it's been um, a wonderful time. Uh, we have had a wonderful time. One thing that has come out is that we really need to do this. Let girls pursue the STEM subjects and careers. Um, whatever we can do in our different capacities. We are teachers, we are educators, we, are, um, we have projects from different organizations. So let's do what we can because uh, we know that this is the future. Our students are the future and where we are going, we need girls um, in this field. And of course, not forgetting the boys. Let's pa let them participate as well. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Uh, we you. can clap hands for our Thank speakers. Thank you. And if you'd like, um, you can either zap us on one of these things or um, traditional business cards at the front. Thank you.